create a story in such a way that people can see themselves in it, even though we're sharing something from our own experience, then then it just it's it serves and can stretch beyond that conversation because it's it's something that can be shared. And so I'm a professor at Cal State Northridge. Um, a huge part of my teaching philosophy is teaching through stories because I know that if I can have the students see themselves in what's being shared and provide relevance and resonance, then they might be willing to pass that along to another student or to a family member or to a roommate or somebody on the soccer team or whatever. And then it can live on beyond the confines of our classroom, which <laughs> right now is all virtual. <laughs> So now things can live in even different ways because anything I provide the students with, they can share it in ways that they wouldn't have had such fingertip access to in the past. So now instead of thinking about, oh, I want to post that to social media, they do so in real time. And uh, so things get to live beyond the moment they were shared. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I, mean, I, appreciate. I remember that day, beautiful, beautiful day um, with Marsh and just the incredible um, group that you brought together. Um, some of you somehow aren't coming in off mute, but I'm going to ask all of you to place yourselves on mute if you can, because we're going to begin. And if you can, I really invite yourself to give yourself fully to this hour. You've given yourself a gift. And, and in that way, the more focus you can have, the more still you can be. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I am, um, you know, one of those people that will oftentimes, you know, uh, do the dishes and clean and, and, you know, do everything as much as I can while listening. And I'm going to really invite you to allow yourself to come to a still space and to really, really receive and in this time of our of, together, I'm going to invite you to really listen for yourself. So it's not just, you know, the one pieces of, you know, information that I'm sharing today, but what happens when your presence is so fully here that what is alive in you comes to the surface and, and is really called forward. And that's one of the invitations that I'm going to have for you today. So I invite us all to begin by closing our eyes. And as you close your eyes, just allowing yourself before you do any deep breathing, before you do anything, just to notice your body in space. And if you are on mute, I'm going to ask you to place yourself on mute. And as you close your eyes, and as you just notice your body in space, just notice how is your body relating to the space that you're in? Are you leaning forward? Are you leaning back? And before just making any story up about it or even quickly correcting it, just allowing yourself to notice what it feels like. You know, if you're leaning forward, perhaps you're overextending. If you're leaning back, perhaps you're not really meeting the world. If you're slumped over, what does that have to say about everything? Our body is this extraordinary, extraordinary you know technology of, of how we get to live in and experience the world and so i invite you in this moment to as you become aware to begin to bring yourself to a place of alignment and alignment it will feel different for all of us but i'm going to guide you through some basic things of noticing your sit bones you know allowing yourself to imagine as if there's a string at the top of your head that pulls you straight up and as you do that, oh, wow, your, your core might get some space, those, those um, you know, all those organs working so hard, you might lift up a little bit. And as you do that, you might just want to roll your shoulders back. That might be the next, the next natural thing. Your, you know, you might want to give your shoulders or your neck a little roll around, just giving it some spaciousness. And from here now, I invite you to take in a nice deep breath. We begin by bringing ourselves into alignment because storytellers, especially the sacred storytellers, the conscious creators, 
We are the seers of the world. And we can only see through as clear as our own lens is. And our capacity comes from being able to see the lens that we see through and then to walk to the left and see through another lens and walk again to the left and see through another lens. Each one providing us another perspective to see the world, each lens providing us another layer. Each lens allowing us to see the wholeness in a story. Whole, holy. These words are connected. And so as storytellers, our first job is to understand where we are in terms of our own alignment. What are we grounded to? What are we connected to? What are we in service to? What are we giving voice to? And so I invite you in this moment to start considering what are you in service to? And I would assume that you are all in service to something, whether you consciously use that language or not. But here is a mo moment to hone your consideration. What are you in service to bringing to these times that we're living to? What is something that you want to grow in your garden that you feed and nourish other people? Do you plant the seeds of joy? Are you committed to watering the seeds of peace, even in times of conflict? Is beauty something that you are committed to? Communion, community. And there are other things that are emerging in you that you are already doing and being and bringing into the world. And I'm just going to invite you to amplify it by clearly naming and stating it. And so I invite you to imagine as if that thing, and I'm going to invite you to, you know, let's just speak, let's just speak to one thing. And I'm going to speak today just the word peace, just because there's so much arising that opposes this energy right now or perhaps even invites this energy more than ever. Look, that was a storytelling twist on just right there in that moment for you. So in this moment, I invite you to imagine this energy that you're in service to as if it's like out in the ethers, this golden dust. And I'm going to invite you to imagine that that golden dust comes and it comes right through the top of your head, that that energy comes straight down to the top of your head as if a funnel and comes to live inside your body. And I invite you to speak out loud as if I invited peace into my body. Then you might speak whatever word yours is, peace, love, unity, peace lives here. And I invite you in this moment, as you just claimed what you're in service to, to now come back to once again, speaking to what, what, what called you here? Was it that there are stories inside that are ready to come out? That you are called to speak stories that hold the resonance of peace, love, unity, community inside of them? Or is the muse tapping you on the shoulder saying, wanting to inspire you, striking you with more inspiration than you can imagine, asking you to call forth and bring us the new stories of our time. Or perhaps you are one of those old storytellers, the cantadoras, those who are carrying forward the old stories. I invite you to listen for throughout this next hour, what called you here? And I'm going to bring you a quote, one of my favorite quotes. And this quote just decided to hide on me. I just love that when that happens. There she is. 
We think we tell stories, but stories often tell us. They tell us to love or hate, to see or be seen, and often, too often, stories saddle us and they ride us and they whip us onward and they tell us what to do and we do it without questioning. The task of learning to be free requires learning to hear these stories, to question them, to pause and hear silence, to name them, and then become the storyteller. That quote is by Rebecca Solnit, and I really love beginning with that quote because it is it, it goes through the process, the journey of a storyteller. First, you have to be able to see a story. Then you have to understand what is that story in service to? What role is it asking you to play? And then there's this choice point, this discernment. Is that story mine? Is that story one that I'm going to carry to give birth to, to give life to into the world? I'm going to give you one more quote. Oh, I'm not going to give you one more quote. I'm just going to tell you what we're going to accomplish to get today together. So here we are. Um, we are going to, you know, I'm introducing you into the landscape of storytelling as a sacred art form. We're going to talk about what is a story. Why is it relevant to the times that we're living in? Um, because we had a special, you know, inquiry around spirituality and storytelling. I'm going to talk a lot about what is sacred storytelling and put a little extra special emphasis on that. We might get to talking a little bit about what a creator matrix is. Um, and I will all along the way, um, hopefully give you a recipe toward telling your own stories. And there's going to be times that I'm going to ask for your participation. And I really, truly love hearing from you. It is one of my favorite things to do. And so I really invite you to, um, as I ask these questions, to come forward. We love hearing your voices and it brings so much richness to our experience together. So um, let us begin. I'm going to begin by speaking to some of the most ancient languages and, and how ancient religions see our speak to language and story. The Hawaiians believe that words are so powerful that they can raise enough energy to slow the world or to set it into motion. And the Sicilians believe that words poke holes in the universe. Think about that the next time you say something that you can't take back. The Australians say that stories from the past must be spung, sung to the present so that the future can exist. The Maoris say that the words don't describe a thing, that they are a thing. And because I'm coming to you from New Mexico, I get to share something that I just learned about um, one of the local, and, I'm, and I'm, I wish I could remember the name of the tribe that I um, just learned this about, but that in this local tribe, the way that the, the words are pronounced, there's no way that you can um, yell them. They're spoken in an in-breath. And so there are certain languages that are designed in their very inherent, you know, cons construction and how they're to be communicated. And all the ancient religions agree that the world was sung, spoken, and chanted into existence. I'm going to say that again because it kind of blows my mind every time I hear it. That the world was sung, spoken, and chanted into existence. Avracadabra is one of the oldest words on our planet. It's from the aromatic mysticism, and it means I believe I create as I speak. And here's a quote that I just love this quote. You know, again, coming back to the power of our language. This quote comes from Stephen Jenkinson. Wherever I go, there I speak. I can't go anywhere, nor can you, without speaking your way there. That's how you arrive. It's like a wake on a boat. It arrives to the shore before you do. So language is an exquisite tool in which we are made. So let's get into it. This is a question that I'm really asking. What is a story? What is a story? You can raise your hand. I'm, I've got my eyes on you. Yes, Amani. Hi. 
Oops, sorry, I'm sorry. I put I I was trying to take you off mute so I can put you on mute. Okay. Amani, can you take yourself off mute so we can hear your question your your, your description? Can you hear me? Okay. Um a story is a a telling of a journey that one has either experienced or heard of or want to be experienced. Hmm. It's experience of a story. It's a, it's a journey. Say the last three things again. It's a journey in which uh, a telling of what was experienced, what is to be experienced, or wanting to be experienced. Wow, what a beautiful description. So you're speaking about, you know, you're speaking as someone that wants to be experienced. You're, you're speaking about intention, and you're also speaking to what are we calling into the world? You know, so a lot of what I'm hearing you speak to a little bit is about vision stories. You know, that it's, you know, a story, right? It's a journey. It takes us from one place to another. You know, it, it's um, a story is not me going to the post office. Oh, the post office, I, I put something in the mailbox. That's not a story. Um, I, I might, if I tell you about my journey to the post office, it's because I met this person there that was looking at these books. And I would ask them, what are you doing with those books? And he's like, oh, here, have some. And all of a sudden, I, I received all these gifts from a stranger. You know, so it's like, so it's, I just say this because some of us are involved with people who like to tell us the facts of their lives. And there's different distinction between the facts and what brings us into context, what brings us into meaning. And then again, what you're speaking to is, um, again, like, what are the seeds we want to plant? What, what, what do we want into the world? And also stories, you know, it's like... Um, when we start thinking about um, what do they do, you know, and you're speaking a little bit about that, they kind of inform us of our roles. We'll talk a little bit more about this consciously or unconsciously. And so what, what kinds of stories do you tell? Are they about brave, courageous women in the world? You know, here we can have an honor, moment to honor, you know, Ruth, you know, our justice, you know, who brought so much leadership, so much grace, right? So much strength the small little body, right? So we carry her stories forward and we tell them now because we're planting that to continue living among us into the future. Thank you. Who else wants to speak to? What is the story? Yes, Laura. I think for me, story is a living, changing, morphing being um, of possibility and potential. And, um, I'm very aware of times of the frequency of words and um, that, that story can inform as well as, as deeply and profoundly transform. Oh gosh, you just said so much. So first of all, you called a story a being. You know, we are, you are speaking my language, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we call it, what, what is it, what is the distinction of a sacred story, but we're just going to go right in there. We're not going to be linear today. And why be linear? Because the archetype of the storyteller is the spider, right? And the spider is, you know, that one who's connecting all the dimensions. So what you're, I'm going off my normal, um, you can't see it, but I actually do uh, speak off of a PowerPoint. I'm going to go straight into this, be alive in the moment. This is one of the things that, you know, if we were taking a storytelling a performance class we talked about how do you be so alive in the moment so you, you spoke about a story being a being and now you're, you're now you're going into that edge of what is a sacred story and how why do we call things sacred you know by using that language we're getting ourselves we're setting ourselves up into a trap right away because as soon as we call one thing sacred we're immediately just through the very use of the language that's why it's so weird we, we are saying that something else is not sacred weird. that mountain is sacred I see the divine and honor that one, but I don't in this one. It doesn't, it, yeah. But for the sake of that, so many of us on this planet have lost our roots, have been cut from our from the roots of our connection of the of, that we are all indigenous in some way, and all of us come from 
uh, of people that have been in relationship to the land and have known how to honor and see the life in it and be in collaboration with it. Uh, we are calling that language back more and more into presence. And so we use this language to remind us what that is, is to see the life in all things. So you just spoke to a story as having a life in it, as being a living being. You know, now, now, you know, it's like, okay, what is it to come into relationship with a story as if it is its own living being? And so now when you're telling a story, you know, you also used, um, you said that it could inform and transform. Is that right? Am I remembering? All right. So now we're talking about that it has the capacity to influence how we experience the world. You also talked about the resonance and language. So, um, you, should, you know, so when we tell a story, you know, that very first practice, I said, what are you in service to and how can you call that into your being? Right. So if I said, I really want to be in service to peace today, you know, even if I'm not feeling peaceful, even if I'm afraid of what's going on in the world, whatever, but if I'm going to be a place where peace can live, and you know that peace is going to live through the resonance in which I speak. And you know that I'm going to choose to tell stories that peace, where peace can live in and peace can be shared with others. And it comes through, it's kind of magical. I don't have to tell you a story about peace for you to have a peaceful experience. So this is, I'm, I'm kind of giving, this is more of an advanced concept that I would teach in more advanced classes, but because it's alive in, in this moment, I just want to um, honor that, you know. So again, it's, it's um, you know, you can tell stories about all different kinds of things, but in the background, you as, as a conscious creator, someone who's aware of your power and influence on the world and that our words create the world around us, you are aware that every word that you speak, every story that you tell is calling for that energy to live among and around you and can be carried by others. So, all right, there's, there's transform, they're, they're transformative. I saw, I think I saw Diana and then Eva. I, and you have to take yourself off and mute. Oh, and then Wendy, sorry about that. Nope, we can't hear you. There you are. Um, I just want to say I'm loving, loving, loving everything you're saying. And um, uh, for me, I've been writing, you know, throughout this period recently that everything has been so hard and there's so much upheaval. And I realized when I read what you were putting out for today, I realized that what I've been writing was in the form of a journal, but really they're kind of stories wanting to be, it's, it's kind of, a, I'm writing about what's happening and how I see it informing myself and people around me and the culture at large. And so when you named, you know, when you talked about stories, it's like, that's the way uh, people, ancient people always told uh, about their culture to the younger generation. That was how they preserved the, the lessons and the, the um, morals and the things they were trying to bring forward because they didn't write it. They told stories. And so stories are, are like what we came in doing. I don't think, you know, we, we, I think every single culture has told stories. And so I, that's, I just wanted to say that this is so delightful to me because I don't have a natural affinity for telling stories, but I feel like what you said, the muse is tapping on my shoulder. So I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And um, I love that. A, I think that when, if the muse starts tapping at your shoulder, start writing, you know, and you are, and we don't have to know what we're going to be writing. And it's when the inspiration speaks. Because the train does go by. There's that great dream to go through that great TED talk. And she spoke about um, a uh, old American poet, I wish I could remember her name, who said sometimes she gets inspiration and it's like a train going by and she's got to catch the tail of it. And I really believe that it's true. So if you are committed to being alive in this creative process, and it's so much fun to be alive in the creative process, then, then, um, then when the inspiration comes, just write, just write it. You know, and yeah. we're just to was uh, that piece around uh, 
teaching stories. What is a teaching story? You know, teaching stories are some of the oldest stories. You know, the storytellers used to be known as the record keepers. You know, and there are some stories. I was just learning about them. In, um, oh, gosh, somewhere in South America. I'm sorry. I'm so bad at knowing the logistics of these things. But, um, but somewhere they, there, there's a story that must be told every single year, and it's a six hour long story, and it has to be told word for word, verbatim. And if the storyteller gets one word out of place, they have to stop and start again. <laughs> yeah. And and to understand, you know, the that um, memory, you know, we understand that our memory is is really affected by the less, uh, the more we write down, the less our memory has to work. And so these cultures that hold all this oral storytelling. Um, and then also teaching stories, you know, teaching stories can work for us. And I have this great story about this, um, uh, this fellow who was, uh, you know, I, I, I heard this at Bioneers many years ago, and there was this indigenous fellow who was talking about how he had forgotten about teaching stories. You know, he, he was in a very committed place of keeping his indigenous culture alive and well and intact. His three-year-old was running around and taking food off of everybody's plate, and he was so embarrassed by how, you know, misbehaved his little boy was, and he was even more embarrassed by having to say no, 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 and do all this stuff and all this reprimanding, and he got home, and he remembered that he had forgotten how to work with teaching stories, and so they created the story of good otter and bad otter. Good otter does this, bad otter does that. And then when they were out and about, they, he could just simply ask his young boy, is he being good otter or bad otter? And so all of a sudden, it's like he put the story to work. It was his babysitter, you know. It wasn't, and, and they had another um, energy to call upon um, in this process. So I just love that example. So thank you for reminding me that. I saw Eva and then Wendy. So I just wanted to take a moment, first of all, to say, I think I know Laura. I think she runs a writing group for elders in Thousand Oaks. Is that true? I that's not her? Oh, anyway, um, I have been trying to communicate to all my friends and anyone who would ever listen that all human beings are indigenous of planet Earth. And I'm so grateful to hear you say that, that uh, shamanic ancestry doesn't just belong to Native Americans or Africans. It belongs to all human beings have that in our DNA in our storytelling, our art making, our singing and music. And I'm so, so grateful to hear somebody other than myself uh, singing this uh, story. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, fellow neighbor. <laughs> All right, Wendy. So um, when you were talking about the folks in our life that like to share facts, I was reminded of an interesting intersection of the difference between appreciation and acknowledgement and how acknowledgement is stating the facts. Thanks for taking out the garbage. But appreciation might sound something more like, babe, thanks so much for taking out the garbage. When I came home and the kitchen didn't smell like last night's dinner, I was really excited to be able to just dive in and cook our meal for tonight. And how like, that's so different, a story, to lay layers of appreciation down as we move through our day, you know, like, I, like because of my work as a professor and, and a speaker, and I think about story from the stage, but there's these little beautiful stories we can weave into the moments of our days, especially during a pandemic, that could create new possibilities and reinforce what we're what we're claiming for ourselves and in the relationships that we choose to be a part of and so i just i love as soon as you said facts i was like oh that's the difference between acknowledgement and appreciation I and so that. yeah that's allison armstrong's work so i i want to give her credit because when she said that i was like oh my gosh that it, that is a colossal difference and so it's down so that we could see that because I think that I really I always value appreciating people and, and acknowledging them when we're when we do that and um, and I so appreciate that piece of also like so oftentimes we can cast people into roles you know consciously unconsciously and 
Um, there's a drama. Humans require drama. We require conflict. You know, it's just in our nature. And I always say, I like my drama in my books and my my movies, not in my life. You know, and so, but but it has to be there. Look, we came in through conflict, through the birth canal. You know, it's like we understand the power and the potency of conflict. It births new things. You know, so there's that meeting of that. So when when I'm in terms of coming back to these roles, like are what role are we casting, you know, people into? I have a situation right now where someone's driving me a little crazy. I've got to tell you, they're really, they're really bugging me. You know, in some ways I could just, ah, you know, but I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand and, and live a medicine of, we can call out the worst in people or we can call out their best. And so when I see this person, I call her priestess. I'm like, ah, you are, you know, doing this, you know, you're, and I try to call out her best part, not excuse me, bullshitting her, because that doesn't do anything, that doesn't get anywhere and anywhere, but how do you call out people's greatness, and how do you seek out, I just, I remember hearing um, uh, Joseph Campbell talk about, um, he was talking about uh, marriages, you know, and, and how uh, he has a very funny romantic and unromantic perspective of it, but he says marriage, it's, it's the work and committed practice of seeing the divine in someone for an entire lifetime. You know, I've seen their greatness no matter what. You know, it's not always going to be easy, you know. And so, again, like, what roles? Now, what happened if we did that? Whoa, here we go. With, I don't know what your political beliefs are, and I'm not going to go into politics, but what if it goes into someone who you really, you know, some people have a certain perspective about this uh, president, you know, and they've cast him into the bad guy, you know. Oh, gosh. Well, what if we just switch the role? Okay, because when we do that, when we have this, whenever there's a bad guy, then there's a victim. So as soon as you pass, cast someone as the bad guy, well then, oh, now I've got to be the victim. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to cast consciously myself into this role. So how do I go this way? And, and whether it's your housemate or whether it's your boss or whether it's your, your beloved or, or a, someone working a political perspective that has power that you don't agree with, how can you, rather than make them to the bad guy, make them into your master teacher oh that's in service to you and then now they're calling something out in you a master teacher doesn't always give you lessons in the easiest way you know we again where the power of conflict um someone just reminded me of this teaching this teaching comes from oh gosh um i'm gonna i'm gonna write him in I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna honor this person in the right way gary schneider i believe is the is the origin of this of this thought, which is that sometimes the the person who looks like our enemy is our protector. Perhaps the wolf is tending to the deer herd by taking the weakest away, and it helps them become stronger and stronger. It's a very it's a thought that you can chew on and take for a walk and be like that thing that actually looks like it's a bad thing might actually be doing something in service to this, you know. So again, when we when we get out of this, um, and this is where that again, what is the sto storyteller's job? It's our job to bring context and meaning. It's our job to bring wholeness to the story, that we don't get stuck in looking at things just one way, that we can live in a bigger, bigger story. How big can your story be? I just had, you know, I'm on a I'm on a journey right now. Normally, you would meet me in my office in my home in Topanga. You know, today you are meeting me in my mobile office because I'm traveling across the country and I just got to go see the Grand Canyon. Talk about a long story. And it was so profound for me in this moment when I am so alive about the, the fear that comes up about, about the unknown of what is going on in this country, you know, and how do I face that fear of the unknown and how, what a relief it is to go see this Grand Canyon, which shows us the length of history of the water rising and the water falling and the water rising and the water falling, and that we're part of a long story. And so then what does it become part of a long story that now, what will you speak into the future? You know, what will you say 20, 30, 40 years from now about how you chose to live in this time and what you brought to these times, even when, and here I'm going to give you a story in this moment. It's a story that I don't normally share, but I love this story. And this story is about, um, it's about a town in California and I, oh gosh, my memory's not working today, apparently. 
Um, but it's a story, and the story goes like this. There were these robbers. These, it happens in the 70s. This is a true story. And there were these, these robbers, and they um, wanted to make a little extra money, and they figured, they, they created this scam that they would go to their local school bus, this local school, and they would hijack the local school bus. And they were going to hide it in um, an old uh, mining shaft. And then they would call, you know, the school and the parents, and they would get the money, you know, and then they would, you know, tell everyone where the bus was. This was before cell phones. So they did the first thing. They, they did. They hijacked the kid, and they kidnapped the school bus, and they put it into this old mine. Um, and they even, like, it got pretty far down there. But all the phone lines in the entire town jammed by all the hysterical families. And so they couldn't get their ransom call in. And so they abandoned the bus. <laughs> in this mine shaft. And that bus driver and those children really believed that there was and they, there was no way out. Everything in them told them that they were going to die. Everything. And and all the information, all the facts showed them that they were going to die. And some of those children cowered down at the very bottom of the like the, it was like all kind of a mess. They had cowered at the bottom of the, of the bus living in that truth that, that they were going to die. And the bus driver and a few of those children fought despite every rationality to get out. And they managed, this bus driver managed to actually like push through a hole into the, out of the bus and rescue all those kids and bring them to life. You know, give, bring them out of the bus and, and they are all still alive. And Sanford's done some research on these children to see the impact of that kind of trauma. And what they discovered was that the children who, despite thinking that all was lost, fought to get out anyway, went on to live normal lives. And I say normal in the sense that they got jobs, they got married, they could take care of themselves. And the children that didn't continued to live out, you know, that ended up showing uh, heavy patterns of addiction didn't go on to live successful, thriving, normal lives. I feel like this is a very important story to share, especially when we're looking at all the predictions around climate change, when we're looking at the fear in our political world, you know? And so whenever we think, I, I always hold tight to this story, whenever we think all is lost, what role will I play? You know, what world will I create even in that moment? How will I live those moments of my life that are in that story? Okay, so I'm going to now tell you a very unsexy expression of what a story is. And, a, 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 and it's a very pragmatic expression, which is a story can also be known as an operating system. It's an operating system where we learn our beliefs, our values, and what we believe is possible. So, right, we understand the teaching story, connect like that. Now start thinking about, and I love this, you know, they, they call that the television shows are programming, right? It's all, it's all in our language. Nothing hides in our language. That's why I love language. You can go to almost any word and go back to the origin of it and all will be revealed. It's talking about the keys to understanding the world around you. You know, um, so right, when we look at the programming, we look at, okay, so what roles did you see in the stories that you grew up around about what they informed you to think about how, what to expect from life and what role you should play in life. Now, if you want to even play with language a little bit more, apocalypse, if you don't know what apocalypse means, Michael Mead brings us up more and more to our attention right now. It is um, the lifting of the veils. It's an old Greek word. So now that I would say that word's been hijacked to think that the apocalypse means it's the end of the world. No, 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 it's just the end of the world as you know it. We are in a great, yes, we are in the time of apocalypse because it is a great lifting of the veils. Oh my God, we can see how things have been really going. It's not like racism and sexism to this degree have been happening all, the, all along. We just haven't been able to see them. And out in the open, now we do. So it could be rather than, uh, ah, don't show me the world. It could be like, oh, wow, now I really get to see the whole story. Now, how am I going to play? So again, as a storyteller, what I love is that you get to grab the reins on the story, 
How are you going to harness the power of these times? How are you going to ride the wave? What stories will you tell? What stories will you, and roles will you invite those around you to live into? Okay, so now we're jumping into what is a sacred story? What is a sacred story? What distinguishes it? Is it a story that um, involves telling a universal truth? I love that. So, right, when I, I like to call that the, the, the inner nod, right? Yeah. That's like that universal truth, that, that, it's that resonance that Laura was speaking to also, you know, when we feel it inside of us. So, I love that. And John Steinbeck says, your story must be about, your re about the reader or it will not last. And so that universality that lives in your story. And so you're like, wait a second. So when I talk about, you know, when I tell my story about getting cancer, you know, my story is not about getting cancer. That's just about a few of us out in the world, or maybe a lot of us out in the world. My story is about, about that time that I, that I met a great initiation. Okay. All of us go through initiations. So my story, when I'm a sacred storyteller, I'm telling a story. I'm, I am doing something in the energy system. Again, you guys must be advanced storytellers because I'm, I really am bringing a lot of more advanced concepts out today. Um, what I understand about a sacred, there's a, there's a time when, you know, we all go through different processes. And uh, I would say, I'm going to romanticize the old um, model and structure of a village is where youth are really well taken care of and they're really seen. There's a lot of people around them that take care of the young ones. And so they're really seen and their gifts are seen and they're called out and they can be given, right? And there's this process where we must be seen, we must be witnessed. And then there, there comes this moment when we get to do this little flip and we, and we do, we end up going and giving back. And now we're talking about going onto the path of elderhood right? We know that olders don't necessarily make elders. We know that young people can be on the path of elderhood, right? And it's this commitment to giving back, giving forward. Really, it's about giving forward. So now when I'm talking about this idea of sacred storytelling, you're, when you're telling a story it, as a sacred storyteller, and this is a little bit edgy, there's, I'm skipping over mountains of content that I would give you if we were talking about trauma. So just understand that. The sacred story, you're doing a give back. You're making the story about those who are in the room so that they might discover something in themselves. So when I, when I do sacred storytelling performances and we do story ceremonies, one of the first things I do is I give the listeners a task and I did that for you today. I invited you to listen for yourself as if you might find something that was specifically planted just for you inside of this talk. And now listen to me, I've said it many times that I'm being thrown off my normal talk because you are, you are calling out things specific to your interests, right? And you don't even have to speak them. And that's kind of the magic of when you enter into a sacred storytelling field. That's why I asked for your full presence, because your listening calls out the story. There we are in an interrelated relationship here. So, um, you know, another way of, of thinking about this is um, there's the science of it, right? You can say that when we create a story together, and a story is that the, the listener is just as powerful as a storyteller. And this is where the great illusion is that the storyteller holds the power. And I'm really going to invite you to consider this because think about our news, you know, our news and all the things and all the people who are, who are dictating the stories of our time, right? And the, the illusion is that they have the power. They're gardeners, they're planting seeds, right? And this is where the master storyteller knows how to prepare the garden for the seeds to grow, right? So as you're talking story, you want to make sure that the people who are listening, if you're planting stories of peace, of love, of connection, of union, look, I'm, I'm just assuming that we've got the all-stars in the room today, right? You know, that, that's what you're committed to, and that's what you're bringing to the world, and you want to make sure that the garden can catch your seeds, that they can grow and be carried. So how do you prepare people to listen? Because it's the listeners that carry the story forward. Does that make sense? So it also means that as listeners, it's the listener that holds the power. It's sort of like the, the, the same illusion between, um, uh, and I hope I'm not being too graphic, but sex, you know? It's the woman. If the woman does not open to receive, it doesn't matter how 
delighted the man wants to have sex, you know, but it's the woman that holds the power in the receiving. Same thing with gift giving, okay? You know, it's like, it doesn't matter if you've got the greatest gift to give if no one's there to receive it. So same thing with storytelling. You know, it doesn't matter how great your story is if the people aren't there to receive it. But that means that also you are so powerful in your listening. It doesn't mean that you have to hide from all the frightening stories of our time. It doesn't mean that you even have to hide from all the lies of our time. It doesn't mean that you have to hide from the horrors of our time. As a storyteller, our job is to be able to see it all and bring it all into context and meaning that each one is a piece, is a thread, and a chapter of a greater, bigger story. And that to me is the great invitation of our time as storytellers. How great, how bold, how big can the story of our time be? Can we put our planet in the context of the universe? What if our, what if our planet had a great big job right now? And we were working it out. We know how Mars influences us. We know how Venus influences us. Well, how does Earth influence us? And what if we were the imagination of the universe? You know, what if we were the heart of the universe? So again, I'm just planting little seeds for you to play with in your creative writing, you know, in terms of how big can the story of this time be? And as you tell that story, you're creating roles for everyone around you to play. Okay. Um, so how do you um, till the soil for your listeners so they really listen? Right. So um, it's all in how you bring them into the space. That's, that's the easiest task. So it's, it's just like any great thing, but your preparation is the, the your, your preparation is 80%, your presentation is 20%, if you can believe that. So when I do, um, when I do sacred storytelling events, you know, where there's a whole bunch of hoopla in it, and it's, you know, part of it is the beauty of it, right? So it, it starts with the invitation. You start preparing people. You know, when I do an event, I say, the doors will be shut because what we're doing is so is, is to be respected and to honored. So it's like you don't just come late for it. So all of a sudden, people are they're on, they're there on time. They're ready. I might invite people to dress a certain way. I might invite people to bring something for the altar. Now they've become part of co-creating. And it's this co-creation process that I think is so potent and so powerful. When you tell people how powerful they are as listeners, all of a sudden you've given them a job. So the next thing I'll do is I'll give you a job. So I did a couple things if you're here at the beginning. First, I brought you into presence with yourself. Normally, I would ask to get to hear everyone's voices, you know, but we didn't get to do that today. But I would ask you to come present that way. I gave you a job. This is one of the great things. And I've heard teachers um, take this and, and use it a lot in their classrooms, where they'll give their students a job, a task, to, some, to listen for something specific. Again, it helps that focus, and it makes it really personal. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, in terms of when I bring people into a performance, also I create a, it's, it's, I create a Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore moment. You know, so if you walk into one of my sacred storytelling events, there's going to be an altar. You're going to be greeted. Someone's going to look you right in the eye, calling you into presence. We're going to serve you, right? We're going to serve you tea. You don't go serve yourself tea and get yourself tea. No, we're, we're creating that Toto, you know, and we're putting, we're giving people the experience of, of receiving. So we serve tea. Um, Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll have people tell people are sitting. So oftentimes I'll have people seated in a circle. Now everyone's engaged in participation. There's no falling asleep at the back of the room, you know. Um, and sometimes I'll do something that really honors and treasures each person. Sometimes I'll drop rose petals on top of each person. You know, and again, people are just kind of shocked into what is going on here. Okay, that's fine. But uh, what if you're not doing a sacred storytelling event and you're on a stage? You can do things that, that speak to you and speak to the people that you're with. When I presented at Google, um, each man that walked into the room, I gave them a rose. I said, man, I didn't realize it was going to be all men. So I looked out into the audience and I felt like I was, I was in the scene out of The Bachelor. But, you know, it's like, but I gave them something that, that shook them out of their normal reality. And then I asked them to smell that rose and then tell me their name because I brought them into relationship with their senses. So again, it's how do, you, how do you bring people alive to the moment and engage them? So I asked you also, I told you at the very beginning, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm really asking you, I want to hear your voices. Again, I gave you a task and an invitation to be actively engaged. Does that help you? Is there another question? Would this also work in a, a book form, Matt, or is it oral, just oral? I'm 
that today's class is focused on storytelling and the you know in terms of oral expressions um mm -hmm. writing getting people's attention that's a whole other ball of wax and okay. talk about different things a lot of it has to do with pacing there's so much it's so specific to what you're creating okay thank you hasina did i say your name right hasina Yes, hello, Hafina. Well, uh, I'm really not a writer, and my mother language is not uh, English, it's Persian for she. Uh, and uh, one of your questions was that, uh, uh, was what's the purpose of your story, what you're giving, and uh, is that I lived in a time uh, in Afghanistan, where I was born and raised, that lasted only 50 years, a time of peace and a time when uh, it was democracy in a poor country like that. So I feel like I'm responsible to tell my experience for my children and and, and it also brings the, the time of the world. It was also particular and then after the 1760, all the Middle East and Iran and everything like, totally changed like upside down. So that, uh, so I really love your approach of writing and telling stories. So, uh, so I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> and yeah. And I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is what I hear you saying is that you want to find a way and you feel responsible to tell to tell your story. And so what I'd like to do is um, do the following with our, with our final moments of class today. I'd like to give you an outline for how to tell a wisdom story or a threshold story. This is a recipe. And the reason why I call it a recipe is I don't know about you. You might, you might be really good at cooking exactly as they tell you. I am not. I use the recipe as inspiration, as a guide. You know, it gets me pretty close to something hopefully fantastic. But I also get a little inspired by other things along the way. So I like to throw a couple other things in and, and cook it up with what I got. And so I invite you to look at this in the exact same way. Um, what I'll do is after I give you this, I will, for those who feel complete, I will, I will bid you adieu and thank you, thank, say thank you very much. And for those who are interested in learning more about how to continue um, and want to take part in a new course that's coming up, um, it starts at the end of the month called Sanctuary. I'll give you a little bit more information about that. And then I'll also tell you about the listening tour, which is what I am doing across the country right now. So just to give you a heads up of what to expect out of the next ah, 15 minutes, let's say. Okay, so here we go. This is a wisdom story. Now, a wisdom story, this is, you know, don't be, don't be freaked out. Some people go, oh God, I don't have any wisdom. And we all have wisdom, we all have lived experience. You know, I say, knowledge is learned, wisdom is earned. And sometimes the very experience of creating our story and committing ourselves to, again, what are we in service to? You're a conscious creator, you're consciously bringing in what you want into this world through any story. You can tell a horrible story. Look, today I told a horrible story about these kids getting kidnapped that had stories of hope and courage you know, inside of them. So I just encourage you to always, um, no, don't, don't be afraid of the bad stories, the hard to tell stories, because they often have the biggest gems in them. But you, the, it's the discovery process of writing and telling them over and over again that really polishes those gems. So we start with a really sucky experience. This is where you begin. Oh, sorry. Yes, a really sucky experience. Something that was really hard. Hopefully, but you have to be on the other side of it. If this is a wisdom story. It didn't happen yesterday. And if you're right and someone else is wrong, this is not a wisdom story. Okay, because what are we doing again? We're going for the holiness, the wholeness of the story. So, and even if you feel right, maybe you're willing, you're willing, you go into the story willing, like a, what did we, what did we say, but a sacred story, it has a life form in it. And, and, and it's a life form, if it's a sacred story, that is here to serve life. It's not a zombie story. I didn't go into zombie stories, but these are stories that are all around us that are not here to serve life. You are creating a story that is here to serve life. So, okay, you got your really, your, your really sucky moment in life. You're on the other side of it. And you're willing to come like a humble friend to get to know it. Your ego is not there saying, I know this story. 
your ego is is you're coming from another place in your being you say i want to learn the, the allness the wholeness of the story i come with an open heart and open ears and curiosity to see something that maybe i haven't seen before and get to know something a part of myself and those around me that i haven't known before it's a very humble process and in some ways, this is the best way because you get, it, it kind of gives you the day off. Your job is just to listen. You don't have to know anything going into this story. So now, where you begin is where does this story really begin? Because again, we said the storyteller is the archetype of the spider. Okay, it's a multiple web, it's multidimensional. When I tell the story, of my experience with cancer, it didn't begin on the day that I was sitting across from a desk in this very cold, sterile hospital room getting the diagnosis. The story began when I was about four or five years old. And you see, my mother is an artist, she's a painter, and I grew up with all these things from painters around my home. And one of them was this great big hand-woven tapestry that hung on my wall, and it was of this woman who was giving away flowers to the children. And on this tapestry was woven, give what you have, Leah, to someone else. It may mean more than you dare to think. And I had no idea what that meant. I just, I was like so new to the world and I was just trying to learn how to read. And so I would read it over and over and over again. Give what you have to someone else. It may mean more than you dare to think. And I couldn't figure it out until I was 30 years old, sitting across from a doctor who told me he was about to cut across my throat and my larynx. And it was a very good chance that I could lose my voice. And that's when I knew what I had. So you see that where does the story really begin? And so when you ask that question, you don't like go in with your ego, trying to figure it out and be all linear. You go into that, you just kind of go into that place of inspiration. You take your imagination and place it outside of yourself so that you can listen in that creative psychic space about, okay, now you can receive the inspiration from the muse. Now what, when perhaps the ancestors can speak. Perhaps the earth that you live upon will speak to you and inform how you tell this story. And it's about allowing yourself to be inspired. And so go for a walk, take a bath, do the dishes, go in your garden. Don't put in your iPod. You know, really allow yourself to listen. Okay. So you've got where the story really begins, you've got your sucky moment. Now you kind of want to go to that universal theme, and we talked a little bit about that before. Okay, and so this is where your story is about your listener. Your story is about that thing in the human condition. So again, if my story was just about cancer, it's just about the people who have got cancer. But if my story is an initiation story, now it's something else because we all go through initiations. And so I invite you to look at, now we're recasting your story already. Right? It, it went from being a really sucky moment to an initiation. And this is where storytelling, this is, you know, we, many people have lost the rituals and the culture that, that where we have formal initiations. And it's in how we tell our stories that is the initiation that we have in this time, in this culture, in this way. And that's what this is. So when I tell this story, I talk about that moment when the doctor told me that, they, that I could lose my voice. Something that you don't know about me is that when I was very, very young, I had a set of, a set of circumstances that allowed me to play into the role of victim. I really understood that role. I knew the part, I knew what to say, and, it, and I knew it so well that I almost, it just became me. I could out victim story anybody in the room. And then all of a sudden, here I was, and this doctor was like coming at me with like this purple, you know, uh, fabric, you know, pillow with the, with the queen of victimhood on top of it. And all of a sudden, I knew that I never wanted to play that role again. And that thought, that process, I wish I could tell you how I knew and where the determination came from not to play that role ever again. But all of a sudden it was like the escape hatch just showed up inside this room, inside this little gross hospital room. And I dove through not knowing what I was gonna do or what I was gonna say or who I was gonna be or even that I was doing it. I didn't know that I was doing it. All that I knew is that when he told me that, the first thing that came out of my mouth was a joke. I just said, 
You just say that to all the pretty girls, don't you? Because this new part of me that was coming alive knew that my new way out of this was to find a way to play, to find humor, to find grace in every single moment, rather than just be committed to the misery and the upset and depression that was also available to me. And so that's how I walked through that experience. Every time I met with a tech, a, a, a nurse, every time my blood was drawn, every time I was, went for a test, didn't matter how scared or how terrified I was, I had a job and that job was to make people laugh. And it helped get me through. So again, we're talking about your, what you're doing is you're throwing breadcrumbs back behind you. You know, it's like, it's like I made it through the minefield. Let me show you how I did it. You know, let me inspire you. No one's going to be able to follow your footsteps exactly, but God only knows what they're going to call on when they're in some kind of rough moment and they've got your story to, to carry them through. So you've got that, you've got that, you know, that universal theme. And again, you don't, it's not like I knew that at the moment. You know, it's not like it was that, it's not like I had a great soundtrack playing in the background. But when you go back and you understand, you put context and meaning, you're like, oh my God, that's what happened. I had no idea. Now you can own it and live in it in a slightly different way. Then we want to look at every good story, you know, has a Magi. You have a Yoda. You have that person outside your family system that helps you um, become who you are. It calls out your great gifts. The actually Cinderella stories. And the, the writer of that said, that, you know, the, the godmother is a very important role in all of our lives. So what was your... What was that being outside your family system that got you through? Again, allow yourself to be surprised. For me, it was a garden. When I first came out of the hospital, you know, when they take away your thyroid, they um, they just they give you a base amount of medicine, not knowing how you're going to respond, and how you respond is, is how they adjust your particular medicine. And for me, they placed me on speed. And I was just going a, m a million miles a minute. As soon as I got out of the hospital, I like, you know, I, 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 I asked a bunch of my friends to come over and to help me build this 70 foot garden. And they were like, Leah, you're crazy. Like, what is it? you're just out of the hospital. Shouldn't you do this? Should you do this? And I'm like, I don't know. I got all this energy. Let's do something with it. So we did. We built this 70 foot circular garden. And thank God that we did. Because very soon after, that speed wore me out. And I sunk into a deep, deep, deep depression. And all I had energy for was to get up, to walk that labyrinth, that cycle, that spiral, and to get myself to work, and to get myself home. And every morning, I would walk that spiral and I would give my gratitude. And I can't tell you how I learned gratitude. I was not grateful before this time in my life. It was not a popular meme that, was, that everybody was talking about. But all of a sudden, it was as if that earth was speaking out loud to me. And I became very, very grateful for my life and everything that I had in that moment. It was the first time I'd ever had that practice. And on my way out of the circle every morning, I would pray. And I can't tell you that I knew anything about prayer before this either. But I would pray. And I would pray for my life. And I believe it was those prayers that brought me here to you today. So again, you speak to allow yourself to, what was the medicine that helped you get through? Who was the being? What was the thing that brought you to the other side? Now, to close out a good story takes great skill and great craft, and we can't pretend to do that in just a couple minutes. You can, when we get, when we're finished, you can write this story in 15 minutes. I want you to know that. You can actually just do what's called a story map, and you can bullet point it, and you can just do it, and then you can fill in the blanks. And I invite you to tell this story three times the next week. And each time you're going to tell it a little bit differently, and it's going to come alive a little bit differently. You can write it, but you don't have to write it, because it's your story. So, but the ending, that's a craft, that's a skill, that's a technique. We don't have time for that today, so I'm going to invite you to practice something that I learned through, through Carolyn Casey. She learned it through John Donahue, and I'm pretty sure he said he got it from the Kabbalah tradition. And it's to end your story with a story blessing. So you take this story that you just told and you place it into the form of a metaphor. And you, 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 you present it into the form of a blessing. So, if you find yourself 
on a dark and stormy night in the middle of the ocean and your ship has sunk. Then, may the light of the moon cast a pathway to shore that carries you with love and with grace and with ease all the way there until you are able to stand on your own two feet grounded on this earth again. You end your story with a little story blessing and they won't be tracking if you didn't finish your story exactly right. So that's a quick way and I really I, I really do believe and I know that you can write that story in 15 minutes. That story that I just told you I wrote in 15 minutes for a storytelling competition at a storytelling festival and there you go. So um, that is our class for today. If you feel complete, then I invite you to have a wonderful day to tell your story, to finish it, and to tell it at least three times this week, because then it will be inside of you and it will start living in the world. And for those who are um, interested in playing and continuing uh, onward more, I'm going to tell you about an amazing course that is starting up, um, I believe, on September 29th. And this class is, uh, I'm just saying, Wendy, thank you for putting Alison Armstrong's information up there. And um, this story is called Sanctuary. And what it is, is it's a course that is really, truly unlike any other class that I've taught before. And I've been teaching sacred storytelling for quite some time. And I've been running a school called Speak with Spark School for Sacred Storytelling for the last three years online. And in that time, I really, truly discovered um, what people need kind of from A to Z to feel complete and understanding who they are as conscious creators, who you are as a sacred storyteller, what is your unique role, what is your unique place. Not only that, what are your blocks, what are the things that get in your way, you know, the barriers, what are the tools that you need to like get around them, and what are your true, like, um, what are your gifts, you know, what, are the, what is your medicine. And so what I learned is when we start with just that, with exploring what your, your unique creator matrix is, and then we dive into creating your mythos, your personal stories, it creates this, this, this place for, for your stories to come alive in another way. And so I used to teach this long class, this year-long class, and now I teach this classes in six-week segments. And the first one is called Sanctuary. And the idea is, is that the story, as we've kind of spoken to, is the sanctuary. It's a place that you invite people into, where they can explore and get to know themselves, where they can explore their own consciousness, where they can reveal who, see who they are in the world, and make conscious decisions about the roles that they play. And then as a storyteller, you're the keeper of the temple. You're the keeper of the sanctuary. And so this first um, class is about really how, what is it to embody that role um, so fully and completely. And so we do it in this really kind of wild, beautiful way, which is we create a sacred space in your home. So it's a multi-dimensional class if I've ever heard it. And um, what you do is, is by doing that, when you actually create something in the physical form, then you can actually see from A to Z who you are as a creator, how you do it, and what gets in your way. I've been a professional creator for over 25 years, you know, paid to produce and create and write and do all these things. And I did this, and it really was born out of COVID. It was born out of this commitment to follow the creative life force. And my creative life force took me straight into creating this. And as I started to do this, all of a sudden, I was like, oh my God, I got to see some blocks, some blind spots that I hadn't seen, that I had been looking for for at least the last five years. And I saw them in two days. And it was almost, it was so extraordinary that I almost wept. And I was like, okay, fine. This is something that I really, really, really want to share. And as I started to um, do it, this very systematic approach to also revealing who you are through the creator matrix. And your creator matrix 
when you look up that literally came through in a dream and I was like I don't know creator matrix everyone's just going to think about Keanu Reeves but when I went back to the etymology of what is a matrix it actually goes back to speak of the womb and when you go back to the etymology of womb you come back to the, to the word of mother you come back to the etymology of mother you come back to the creator of all things so now we're looking at what you know the etymology of this is saying like who are you as a creator what did you come to create in this world um, and and again like what is your unique operating system and so this course really supports you in um, in understanding what your unique operating system is and we do it through story we do it through developing your own rituals uh, we have some amazing guest teachers that you will get to um, watch at your own um, time in terms of um, learning from um, people who really get you to understand that wholeness of what it is to be a storyteller. So our first uh, guest speaker is Brooke um, Medicine Eagle and she tells you the story of White Buffalo Woman and she speaks to what is it to come into relationship with sacred? What is ritual? You know we also speak with Elaine Kalila and she brings you through this beautiful meditation of understanding sanctuary inside your own being. You know, and, and we'll come to Alika Atai, who is a, a, a farmer, an indigenous farmer in Hawaii. And again, I talked a lot about this metaphor of gardening, you know. And so all these teachers bring you through this process of seeing this, the act of storytelling, the act of creating, as a completely holistic process. And so you come out on the other side um, with a few stories, you know, with, with really the, the, the material to tell your stories and a really concrete understanding of where your strengths are as a storyteller. What are the stories that you are here to tell? And so it helps bring you onto this path of clarity. And again, this language of what is it to be a conscious creator? And so what I do when people register for sanctuary in the next 48 hours, I throw in uh, my, my master library of guest teachers. And that's over 30 hours of, of teachers who have taught in my program for the last three years. That's everyone from Michael Mead to Carolyn Casey to Stephen Jenkinson to, I mean, there's just, it's, I'm so in awe of this library. And so I throw that in as a bonus gift for you. And so um, if you have any questions about that, I would happily answer them. And I'll also, um, bring you the link so that you can have it at your fingertips right here and uh, the other thing that happens in that class that I just love is that we work together in small groups and this is the part that I have to say people have loved the most and a lot of people who have come to my classes and they, they, they get these special groups and these are your groups of greatness these are the people who are there to and we do a lot of work that helps you support you know how, how do we see the greatness in each other how do we call out that greatness in, in each other and um, and how do you weave and support you know what we're doing in class and then have those people that help you hold, help hold, help hold you accountable so that you do all the different things that really help you get the most out of each class and um, I have heard so many times now that those groups of people just keep meeting and that makes me so delighted because you know it means it's working we're connecting the, we're weaving a whole new way of being together so that is that um, I will say that I do have a year-long program and um, our web designer was on vacation at a very inconvenient time so that it is not it is not up there but this is the introductory course and so if you feel called to it then um, if you register will and you want the year-long program we'll work that we'll work that in so but no matter what this is where we begin any other questions about sanctuary? Anything that you want to know about that? And then I'll tell you about the listening project. I, I just wanted to know the time. I've been doing a shamanism class that's going to go every Tuesday night till October 6th. Yep. And, um, I'm, I'm ready for the next step, which is with you. Uh, and I know I am. And I was just curious uh, what the timing is. Thank you. For that class is the last time I did it at 10 a.m. So the, so the the Europeans could come in. It starts September 29th to November 3rd. It's for six weeks and it's on Tuesdays from five to seven. So it sounds like if you did that, you might miss the first one. That's not the end of the world. If you miss if you miss the first one, that's okay. And you'll see. So oh, it is in the evening. 
It is in the evening from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Pacific, yeah. See, that's exact the time of my shaman class with Sandra Ingerman, yeah. which goes through October 6th. So. Yeah, so yeah, you'd miss the first two, I guess. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Hopefully, you'll offer it again. This is the last time this year that I'm planning on, on doing Sanctuary. I'll do a one-day class at some point just in the Creator Matrix. Um, but you can always come in and join the next class, which is Eros. So we'll be doing Sanctuary Eros, which starts um, somewhere in October, in late October, and that's all about power and purpose. So this Sanctuary version is all about your creator matrix, and the next one will be about power and purpose. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to know the cost. The cost is, I can look it up myself. So it is, it's $350 for the six week class. And then when you sign up for the next class right after it, which is a four week class. And so the way that the program works is it, is it ebbs and flows with the form of nature. So for six weeks, we do a sanctuary class and, we, it, and it's an inward process. It's a discovery process. It's, it's digging for the gems, what, you know, what's, what's in there. And then, the, the, then we take a two week break. And then the next four week class is, a, is where we harvest the gems and we come out to tell the story. So the next four week class that comes after that one is um, wisdom stories where we'll be telling uh cultivating our wisdom stories and so when you take both sanctuary for um and wisdom stories at the same time you get a 50 dollars discount so um but sanctuary itself is 350 dollars that's all on that website and with covid times you know we understand that things are weird and strange and so i do do um we do do uh payment plans if that's if that is what would make this more usable for you. And then what you will also get is a series of guest speakers. So when you're signed up for the classes, those guest speakers are essentially, the live sessions are essentially for free. And if you don't take the classes, but you just want to be with our live teachers and be in the live speaker series, you can take those individually. So just more things to consider. Um, the teachers that I just spoke to you about, those are a pre-recorded part for that sanctuary creative nature. So that's a little bit different. How many, yes. how many of the classes are live versus um, taping the taped ones that we watch ourselves? So every class with me is live. So those six classes are live. And then the, the taped classes, I believe, are five. There's five of those. And those you can watch. They're scheduled to watch, to watch beside each class. And they're an hour long. Will there be um, assignments like writing stories and then telling them to each other as part of it? So for sanctuary, a lot of the process is actually the, the process for that class is creating a sacred space. And then while you create your space, you find all the things. So the idea is like matter, like how you relate to matter matters. And so every single thing in your space has a story and perhaps you want to carry it, perhaps you don't. And there's going to be, it's very hard to explain. I, I definitely go, advise looking at that page and then seeing the testimonials, the people that go through it, because it is such a nonlinear experience. Um, but, but basically you're going to develop, based on what you discover, you'll, you'll, you'll develop rituals and will develop story um, assignments based on what you discover. But this class is a discovery process. You'll have lots of writing assignments throughout the entire thing, tons and tons and tons. The next class, Wisdom Stories, that's when you come out to, it's a, that is a story um, skills class. So by the end of that class, you will have your own wisdom story to tell. You will practice it, you will have told it, you will have shared it in class, and you'll carry that wisdom story forward. So slight distinction, that makes sense, where Sanctuary is all about development and process and exploration, and the Wisdom Story is all about cultivating, harvesting, and telling. Does each class build on another or in other words, you have to go through sanctuary before you can take the wisdom class. They are designed to build on each other and they're also designed to stand on their own. So I'll say without question, there's a richness and there's a culture in the community that's being built by those who are going through it. Um, but there's also a real like come one, come all, come join and play um, as you are ready, if that makes sense. Do you have any writing? Have you written any books or anything that you know would be available? Are you planning on writing any books? Yes. So <laughs> I'm actually 
actually have a multi-book series called The Whale Dreamer. You can actually go to thewhaledreamer.com and see it. It's something I've been working on. I'm sorry, you're cutting out. You're cutting out. Um, it's called The Whale Dreamer. The Whale Dreamer. Okay. Whale, Whale Dreamer. And so that's a young adult series that is all about the sixth mass extinction. It's not, um, I'm working with a publisher with it, on it right now. It's not out yet. And I actually have a guide that goes with Sanctuary called the Conscious Creator's Guide to Psychic Silence, Begin Ritual Prayer. I can't even remember what the title of it. It's way too long. But anyway, it's- Is this on your website? Is all this on your website? Yes. Okay. So you'll get that guidebook as part of this. And then you know, I write in the blogs, the story letters and everything. Yeah, um, I was wondering if the, um, so it sounds like if we're looking at our calendar moving forward and we want to work with you, which I do, mm -hmm. um, that carving out Tuesdays from five to seven Pacific for all of eternity it <laughs> would be to our advantage. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that. Um, some of my classes are on Tuesdays from 5 to 7, and some of them are in the mornings from 10 to 11. Okay. And, not all, um, and I do that so that, um, I'm sorry, I just realized that I'm running late to a meeting. Um, and so it's, it really totally depends on, I try, to, I try to mix it up, so because I have a lot of people from Europe and Australia that come. Okay. And, and time tends to work for them. And so for sanctuary and wisdom stories, are those both from five to seven? Sanctuary is from five to seven, and I believe wisdom stories is from 10 to 12. Okay. And then are the live um, sessions recorded? Yes, everything's recorded. So it's conceivable if you're going to, like if you see that you can attend a certain amount, if you just choose to commit to this, then there's a way for that to work. Right. Okay. Um, Thank you. When you sign up for the whole year long program, or I think it's, sorry, it's a nine month program. Um, you get a, I think you get like a basically, basically we take a, there's a reduced price. I can't remember exactly what it is, but you get a nice reduction. Thank you so much. Thank you for today. Absolutely. Oh. Yes. I want to thank you for today as well. And I'm so sorry that I was late. I was outside in my backyard, captivated with a slew of monarch butterflies. And I, <laughs> I totally forgot where I was, who I was. Um, but I, I'm so grateful for everything you had to say today. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. I, I too will have um, a conflict with your class, but I will follow you and try to catch up later. Okay, sounds good. There'll be more. Okay. Thank have a lovely weekend and uh, may blue skies be with you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good prayer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> bye bye.